Okay, guys, how are we doing? Good to see you all here. The Nations League roster has dropped. It's not dramatically different than anything, you know, what we thought it was going to be, but it is still interesting to talk about. And it's good to see so many people in the stream already chatting. How you doing? Uh, did you make it to work today, Filippo? Uh, I know you were rushing. I was in Filippo's live stream today, hence the new profile in here that's teasing me about waking up too late. Um, I always look a little groggy until about 11 a.m. So, yeah. Um, yeah, guys, it's an exciting roster. We're going to talk about it. I'm going to go through it uh, with the, you know, the templates like I always do. And then we're just going to hang out for an hour. We're going to talk about it. It's, it's before we get into it, guys. Oh, tactical. Filippo's at work. Okay, man. Hey, Ken, how are you? Mapled, mapled, all of you guys. Good to see you here. Before, you know, we get into the X's and O's of the roster, I just want us to stop and take a minute uh, and really think about where we're at right now and how exciting a time it is to be a USMNT fan, right? We're talking about, you know, top, top players playing in top, top leagues, winning trophies in multiple leagues. We have two players missing the first game of this series because they're in the Champions League final. I mean, it's crazy. So it's going to be so exciting. We're, we're just going to go straight into Nations League and then into Gold Cup and then boom, you know, World Cup qualifying and all the way up until December of next year, there's going to be a lot going on. So, all right. How are you guys doing? Um, let's just go over the roster real quick and then we can talk about it. So, share. Still figuring this out, guys, so bear with me for a second. Okay, so goalkeepers, David Ochoa, Zach Steffen, and Ethan Horvath. Now, this is very similar to the goalkeepers that we saw um, last week in the Switzerland roster, except exactly what I predicted happened. Zach Steffen replaces Chichuru Odunze. So what this tells me is Ethan Horvath is very likely to be our number two. We'll probably start against Switzerland, I imagine. Um, I hope he does at least. I think he's a better option than Ochoa at this point. Uh, but it also tells me that Matt Turner will very likely be in that Gold Cup roster and will probably start in Gold Cup. And let's face it, guys. Right now, it's between Ethan Horvath and Matt Turner to be Stefan's backup, right? Before either of them can actually challenge Stefan for that number one spot, they need to claim that backup spot and be like, okay, I am the undisputed number two. In Horvath's case, he needs to get a move. And playing against Switzerland, like his contract is over this summer with Bruges. So playing against Switzerland will maybe give him an opportunity to be in the shop window and to be an option. And who knows, maybe he'll start against Costa Rica or maybe David Ochoa will get a start against Costa Rica, depending on how Burr Halter sees the situation. So happy with these goalkeepers. The only question mark I have, guys, is if something happens to Zach Steffen, is Ethan Horvath ready to play a Nations League final against Mexico? Now he's played three games this season, once in the Champions League group stage and two in the Belgian League, including one last week in which he actually played pretty well. I just don't know if I would feel so confident having Ethan Horvath play against Mexico in a Nations League final. But overall, I'm pretty happy with this roster. Zach Steffen, by the way, guys, has not had that great a season. Yes, I know he won the Premier League and the FA Cup and all of that. But he's had some concentration lapses, and he looks a little bereft of confidence. So I'm going to be watching him in these Nations Leagues because we really cannot afford a big mistake or any mistake from Zach Steffen in the Nations League. A mistake against Honduras, and we could be out. Anyways, it's a good roster overall. Let's move over into fullbacks, guys. We got Serginho Dest, Anthony Robinson, DeAndre Yedlin, and Reggie Cannon. Now, I said in last week's video that I thought Burhalter would just take um, – three fullbacks because you have Serginho who can play left or right. Turns out he took all four. This points to Serginho Dest playing at least some games on the left. Uh, DeAndre Edlin is back in the fold after a long time being out. Now he's a, he's a bit of a controversial one, DeAndre, because he is very experienced. Um, he's always been a pace merchant with no technique. You know, that has been the, the story of DeAndre Edlin's life. He was born and raised or rather developed in the old school of American development, right? Where try hard, run fast was the model. Athletic, you know, players, quick players got preference, but he never really developed technically. And when you compress time and space, he has struggled. It's why he struggled 
in the Premier League. It's why he's now in Turkey, which is a little bit more his level. That being said, maybe Burhalter felt like having an experienced guy in the roster is a good thing. You know, uh, maybe he's a guy who can give advice to the younger players, who can be a calm, calming presence, you know, and maybe he's worth a look at against Switzerland. You know, he is in his prime now. He's 27 years old. He's got 62 caps. He's been around the block. He's played at a World Cup. So I don't hate him being called back in. This means very likely Brian Reynolds uh, will be in the Gold Cup. And that's be another interesting one to watch for the future. Okay. Center backs. We got John Brooks, Mark McKenzie, Tim Ream, and Matt Miazga. Now, in the Switzerland roster, they also had Justin Che. He wasn't in the Nations League provisional roster. So I know that he, you know, I, I knew he wasn't going to be here. I thought there might be a few more changes. Now, Aaron Long is out with the Achilles injury, and no Chris Richards is the big miss here. Very likely he's not fit to play. Now, that is a big, big miss. And guys, I have some defensive question marks with this team. We look a little fragile defensively. What I like to see is Mark McKenzie in here. You know, Mark McKenzie is a guy who he did a, a lot to impress me. He made the Belgian team of the week in his last two appearances. So he's having a late season resurgence. He didn't play every game, uh, you know, with Genk, but he has been improving dramatically and he could still be in Champions League next year. What's good about Mark McKenzie is that he's very good with his feet. And he can play both left or right center back. Tim Ream is here as John Brooks's replacement. Uh, Matt Miazga is Matt Miazga. And I'm going to talk a little more, you know, in the stream about our defensive uh, weaknesses. I like to see this. I'm glad that McKenzie is here over a guy like, say, Walker Zimmerman, who could have been called in. Um, Tim Ream also brings experience. You know, this is a very experienced defensive line. John Brooks, Matt Miazga, Tim Ream, you know, DeAndre Yedlin is there. So there's a lot of experienced in here, which I think Burhalter is relying on, you know, just to have that experience in the roster. Um, I don't hate this. I, I really don't hate this. You know, some people have made arguments for CCV or EPB. I'm not huge fans of either of those guys. And I can tell you why in a little bit. I just think that they don't really fit with the way that we're trying to play. Uh, in the future, though, with Chris Richards and Justin Shea, hopefully Chris Richards will be in the Gold Cup. I hope he's fit enough to play in the Gold Cup because we need to give him an extended run out as a starting center back. Because I think come World Cup qualifying, you know, Richards and Brooks is our first step, our, our first choice pairing. Okay. Midfielders, Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, Eunice Musa, Sebastian Legette, Jackson Ewell, and Kellen, Kellen Acosta, him of the too many caps. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, this was about as we expected it to be. Quick note on Tyler Adams. He's not fully fit. And he may not end up being in the Nations League roster. Uh, Greg Berhalter said in a press conference this morning that they can still change players up to 24 hours before the Nations League starts. So he's probably a last-minute fitness check. If he is not available, I sincerely hope the guy that gets called in to replace him is Luca De La Torre and not... I don't know, um, Christian Roldan, for example. I know Owen Odesawi is injured, so that's not a possibility. Um, I hope it would be Luca De La Torre if we have to replace Tyler Adams. But Tyler Adams would be a big miss because he is going to be protecting that back line, which is still, you know, a little fragile defensively. I have said everything I need to say on Jackson Ewell and Kellen Acosta. I don't need to repeat myself. You guys know how I feel about them. Um, if Tyler Adams is not available, though, I've said this before, let's try Yunus Musa at the six and move Geo centrally and then give the right wing to either Tim Weah or Brendan Aronson. Tim Weah uh, is an option. He tends to go missing a lot during games. He, he's not very involved in the game. Uh, but he does, you know, he'll sneak up and do something amazing every now and then. So it just depends what you're going for. I probably prefer Brendan Aronson on the right, at least right now. Sebastian Legette is going to be there. You know how I feel about him as well. Okay, so there's your midfield. Luca De La Torre is the only real miss who I would have preferred here over Jackson Ewell and, or Kellen Acosta. But hopefully, guys, in the Gold Cup, we could have a very interesting midfield if we get guys like Luca De La Torre, Paxton Pomacall, Caden Clark, Gianluca Busio, um, maybe Owen Otisawi if he's fit at that point. I don't know. Uh, it could be a very, very interesting midfield. And last but not least, we have the six forwards. I'm mostly quite happy with this, guys. Christian Pulisic, Josh Sargent, Gio Reyna, Tim Weah, Brendan Aronson, and Jordan Sivachu. I think the only real question mark people have about this is Daryl DK, why he's not there. Um, 
I probably would have selected Daryl DK over Jordan Sibachu. They're different kinds of players. Okay, Jordan Sibachu is more technical than Daryl DK. He, you, you can see it in his game. He's better on the ball. He's not as dynamic with his off-ball movement as Daryl DK, and he definitely isn't as, um, what's the word? He's not as physically dominant as Daryl DK. So the reason I would have probably selected DK is just I think he can offer something different to Sargent. You know, if you need a goal, you bring on Daryl DK and he's going to bully defenders. And I think that just offers something different. But Greg Berhalter clearly went with Jordan Sibachu and I have no problem with it. So that, guys, is the roster. All right. Abby Anderson. Yes, I was just going to say that. Greg Berhalter did say that DK would travel with the team and play the Costa Rica game on the 9th. So, yes, would have been very, you know, I'm glad that Daryl DK is still going to be there. He's still going to be involved. Uh, Matthew Hoppy, I know Jackie D says Matthew Hoppy better than Sargent. Uh, do not agree there. But, yeah, Hoppy and DK are hopefully both guys that could be in the Gold Cup, you know. Uh, I'd rather have guys like that than someone like, you know, Jossie Zardes. Okay. So, yeah, it, what this points to is a very good starting 11 and some question marks about our depth. That is my concern, guys. And before we get into depth, let's talk about defensive, the, the defensive side of our game. Aaron Long, and I know a lot of people don't like Aaron Long. I believe that Aaron Long was a good partner for John Brooks because they covered for each other's weaknesses and they enhanced each other's strengths. Okay. John Brooks, very good with the ball. Um, Aaron Long, not so much with the ball at his feet. But John Brooks's big weakness was when the ball is played in behind him and he has to defend on the turn. John Brooks is not the fastest to recover, to, you know, do make what's called a recovery run or defending on the turn. And so that was a problem. Uh, Aaron Long, on the other hand, very good at, you know, covering for John Brooks. Very quick, very good at making those last ditch tackles, reading the game well. So they worked well together. Now Miazga is very likely going to start with John Brooks. And he's very similar to John Brooks. Good with the ball at his feet. Not as good as Brooks, but decent. Uh, but again, when the ball is played in Miazga, he's not great at defending on the turn. He's not great at making recovery runs. The other problem with Matt Miazga, guys, is that he's very, um, I don't want to say error prone. I would say unreliable because he might play a great game and then do something shockingly stupid that could lose you the game, right? Whether that's a stupid tackle or just he'll lose concentration. We saw, we've seen this in his last few USMNT appearances. And I have concerns about Matt Miazga and John Brooks as a partnership, okay? On top of that, there's no Tyler Adams protecting that back line, okay? On top of that, both Anthony Robinson and Serginho Dest, for being very good going forward, still struggle defensively, okay? I, I have question marks about this team defensively, and especially against... Honduras, where we're going to be going forward a lot, probably having a lot of possession. I imagine Honduras just sitting back in a low block and then looking to hit us on the counterattack. And that could be very effective if we're not careful about how we set up when we have the ball in order to not be so susceptible to the counterattack. So when we have the ball, is our shape and our tactical awareness ready to gag and press immediately when we lose it. Because if you're weak defensively, you have to start your, your pressing up top. You have to, when you lose the ball, you have to gag and press, right? What in English is called counter pressing. You have to counter press quickly to stop them from building a counter attack. And that's going to be very, very important for us. Or we could lose one nil to Honduras on a, on a rough game, on a rough day. I don't think we will, but I just think it's important to highlight our weaknesses and not just jump in like, oh, we're gonna meet, we're gonna beat Honduras for sure. Can't wait to try and beat Mexico, right? So those are the things that concern me. I'm also concerned about when we need to change the game. Do we have enough off the off the bench in order to do that, right? Sebastian Legette. If it's Brendan Aronson or Jordan Sibachu, Tim Weah, okay, great. You know, if not, I just think we could do more uh, having a guy like you know Luca De La Torre here, 
you know, uh, would have been better off the bench. But overall, guys, I'm pretty happy with this roster. Only four MLS players. And it's not that I hate MLS players. Of the four, I don't really rate two of them at all. Uh, and that's Acosta and Yule. You know, I'm fine with Ochoa and um, who's the last MLS are on there? There's four of them. Ochoa, Acosta, Yule, Legette. Yeah, I'm fine with Legette. All right. Okay. Sean Costello with a good question. Let's get into them here. Pete, what about Weston at the six if Tyler is hurt? So I think that Weston can play the six. I don't think he's as, I think Musa is a better option at the six. And guys, before I forget, okay, let me, let me answer this question first. Weston offers more in the attack. He's more goal dangerous. He has more end product, right? Um, Musa is a little bit more ball secure. Weston's a little immature. Okay. And, and he loses concentration sometimes defensively. He doesn't always do the job he needs to do. Musa is a little more ball secure and a little better defensively than Weston. And that's why I would keep him there. And then I would have Weston up top or not up top, but in those dual eight roles with Gio Reyna, who in my opinion should play central. But I have, I have talked about that many times. Yes. Musa does make mistakes guys. Lots of people make mistakes. They're very young. Musa's 18. Look, I don't think Musa is a guy that should necessarily be an automatic starter for us. And I've said this before. I think Geo in the middle would be my preferable option with Weah or Aronson on the right. That's just my idea, but I'm not Greg Burhalter. He's going to do it his way. And like I said in a previous video, I'm giving Burhalter the benefit of the doubt this summer, but he has to win trophies. He has to win at least one trophy because there's no excuses now, guys. They've had seven, eight friendlies to prepare this team. We have an excellent, excellent roster of players. There's no excuse to not win a trophy. If you can't win a trophy with this group, a regional trophy, then real question marks about your ability to, as a coach. Let me play this quick video from our sponsor before we go forward, and then I'll answer some questions. Happy to say that 11 Yanks has a new sponsor. One Football is an app that allows you to get all of your news, transfers, stats, and in match updates from over 160 leagues in over 60 countries. I've been using this app for the last few weeks, and here's what I love about it I can select the teams that I love, in this case, the USMNT, and with one click, I'll have access to all the news about the teams, statistics from past games, lineups, information about future games, as well as who is part of the roster. I can also do the same thing for specific players, select the ones that I want to follow, and I'll be able to track that player's data, performance, and stats throughout the season for both club and country. So check out the app, guys, One Football. Click the link in the description below to download the app directly and start getting all the information you need about the players and teams that you love. All right, so you guys know One Football. I've talked about it all, 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 you know, the whole month long. Thank you for sponsoring us, One Football. Link is in below. If you haven't already, guys, go download it. Um, it's a great app. I have it on my phone. I use it frequently. It gives me a lot. Okay, so we did have a super chat here from American Soccer United. By the way, guys, underrated channel. Go um, subscribe if you haven't already. Which MLS player would you replace Acosta with? Okay, on this roster, um, good question. Any any of them, honestly. Paxton Palmacall, Eric Williamson, probably even Caden Clark, maybe Gianluca Busio, Tanner Tessman, even. Any of those guys, honestly, I would replace Acosta with. That's how little I believe in Acosta. Um, not rolled down. No. No. Where's Josie? Not here. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah, look, uh, there's a lot to be excited about, guys. I, I really do think we're gonna have a great, um, we're gonna have a great, great team here. We really are. And by the way, in case I haven't said so already, um, Filippo and I will do the same thing we did back in March. So we're gonna have the live stream. I'll be on Filippo's live stream for the pregame for halftime, and then I'll probably jump in on the stream once or twice during the game. And then after the game, we're gonna come to Eleven Yanks for the post stream, uh, like a you know, a game review and um, hang out after for about an hour, hour, 15 minutes. So hope to see you all of you guys there. It is super fun uh, doing these. I really enjoy them and I hope that you guys can make it. Um, I had a really good question here. Uh, what was it? I missed it already. Pomacall, 
needs time to get back into form. Uh, yes and no, guys. Um, I like Paxton Pomacall. I just don't know why Lucci hasn't started him. He's been very good off the bench every single time he's played this season. I think it's time for him to get a start. Uh, the other thing, guys, is that on Patreon, for all four of these games, from Switzerland to Costa Rica, after the game, I'm going to do a, you know, a live stream here, and the next day I'm going to put a video on Patreon where I basically highlight the key moments of the game with the video clips of it, which I cannot do on YouTube, right? So highlights of the game, not just the highlights as in like, oh, this was the goal that was scored, but key moments from the game where I highlight what we did well or what we did poorly or, or moments that changed the game or things that I noticed where we were playing and that contributed to you know, the score line or to the game state. So if you're, if you're not already, get, get on Patreon, guys. We're going to have some really good stuff next month. All right. Dominican stud, Jeffrey Hernandez. How are you doing, man? You are the coach of Honduras. What will be your strategy against the USA? Try not to say park the bus unless you really think that's the best strategy. Um, I do think that's the best strategy, um, but, but it's, it would be a little more complex than that, okay? So what I would do, it depends if Tyler Adams is playing there or not. If there's no Tyler Adams, and if I notice that Kellen Acosta or Jackson Yu is starting, I would instruct uh, Choco Lozano, who is their best player. He's playing for CF Cadiz. Uh, I would instruct him not to play up against the, the center back. So don't go play, you know, as a sort of off the shoulder, as they call it, with John Brooks and Matt Miazga. I would pull him back a little and have him play between the lines. So between the midfield line and between the defensive line. Because one of two things is going to happen if he does that. Either it's going to draw Miazga or Brooks in forward, which is going to leave space in behind for guys like Romel Kyoto. Th their wingers are very, very good. It's Kyoto and Albert Elif to give them space to make those diagonal runs in behind. Or either that, or if Tyler Adams is playing, then I'm going to have Choco Lozano go wide and try to get in behind to those spaces that are going to be left behind when Anthony Robinson and Sergio Dest bomb up the field. Okay. So it depends who's playing, but generally speaking, I'm going to play a very defensive game and I'm going to try to hit the U S on the counter attack. That is what I would do and what I expect them to do with some small tactical variations, depending on who we're playing and how we're going to play. But those three can be a real threat, Lozano, Kyoto and Elise. So this is, not at all a foregone conclusion that we're going to win this. Thank you, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Somebody asked me earlier a question about the USSF sum breakup, and I did want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I think it's a good thing off the top of my head because, you know, Don Garber, okay, was on the, the sum board or the sum CEO, okay? He's also the head of MLS, and he was on the USSF board. Okay, this is from Robert. Robert, what was your initial thoughts? Carlos Bocanegra, who's the technical director of, director of Atlanta United, is on the USSF board. Okay, the unholy trinity of MLS, USSF, and some has not been good. Now, it's a complicated issue. Okay, because there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of uh, marketing involved. There's a lot of pressure on the you know USSF from some from MLS to try to incorporate. You know, there's been interference in the past with rosters. There's been interference, uh, pressure, not interference. I, I don't want to claim that. I will say there's been pressure to you know have it at certain venues to play US games. It just has not been a good relationship for the national team. Okay, the national team is should not be a marketing avenue for your domestic league. Okay, your domestic league should be able to market itself, all right, based on its own quality. So I'm very glad that it's splitting. A little sort of plug, I am br working on bringing on somebody to talk about this who's extremely knowledgeable about the situation. Somebody you all know, um, very, very good guy to know. Um, I've, I've been trying to get him on the podcast, and, on, on the show, and it looks like he is going to be able to come and talk to me about this live. So keep your eyes peeled for that video because he is going to drop the scoop on what really is going on and the relationship between some USSF, MLS, and what this split means for the national team uh, going forward and for also for MLS. So 
keep your eyes peeled for that video, guys. But my initial thoughts are I'm very glad this split happened. For me, no, it's definitely not Grant Wall, Elijah. Uh, for me, it is more a question of what they do now, you know, as far as the marketing goes. Okay. So interesting times to be a USMNT fan, but overall, in my opinion, this is a very good split. Okay. Pete sources, Greg Berhalter. Yeah, no, it's not Matt Doyle. No, no guys. It's, I don't bring people on the show unless I respect them. Okay. So it's not Grant Wall and it's not Matt Doyle. Not to mention those guys would never come on the show anyways. Um, what are your thoughts on players like Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David? Good players. Um, sucks for them that, I mean, Canada is going to have to surround them with better players, you know, because Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David are excellent. The question is, how are they going to be able to play with players who are not at their order? Okay. Andy Garcia, is it Sam or Paul from allocation disorder? Um, I will say this. I can neither confirm nor deny that at this moment, but I am working on something. That's all I'll be able to say. Thank you, Andy Garcia. All right. Canada is getting stronger. By the way, if there's any Canadian fans, uh, Tejon Buchanan, who plays for New England Revolution, I've been really impressed with him, the opening games of MLS. Very underrated. There's been rumors about him maybe going to Europe, which I think is likely at this point. So... Uh, let's keep an eye on him, but Canada fans, Tejon, is it Tejon? I think it's Tejon, Tejon Buchanan. Um, another quality player to watch for Canada. Look, I want Canada to improve. I want Canada to be as good as Mexico in the U S or at least I want them to be pushing, right? They have a ways to go to get there, especially their defense is awful, but they, but I want them to continue to become a better team because guys, we're stuck in CONCACAF for better or for worse. And the only way that we're going to be able to have serious competition is for other teams in CONCACAF to get better. That includes Suriname, Haiti, Curacao, Jamaica. You know, we want everybody to improve. Okay. Canadians don't exist. It's just a made up land. You guys. All right. Send those questions, guys. I'm taking questions for the next half an hour. So. I think I've covered this. Oh, let me read real quickly um, from Paul Tenorio a little bit about the DK situation. Paul Tenorio put on Twitter, and I retweeted this if you want to go see it yourself. Burhalter says, Daryl DK will travel with the USMNT throughout camp. Said decisions for two Nations League games were based on form. DK will play versus Costa Rica on June 9th. Wanted to replicate carrying more players and picking 23 for games like World Cup qualifying, but couldn't. Burhalter, Burhalter said it was a tough decision with DK, but that he has a bright future with the USMNT. Cited good form from Sivachu in Swiss League and Sargent's season-long output for Werder Bremen. Burhalter says Tyler Adams is important enough to team to put on the roster even with injury doubts. They had to submit roster today, but can make injury replacements up until 24 hours before the first game. Again, so much about this entire four-game camp is meant to replicate World Cup qualifiers this fall and winter. Game in Europe, travel to U.S. for three World Cup qualifiers, heavy squad, rotation, all prep for the upcoming World Cup qualifiers. So that's all good and well. Uh, that's just more information, you guys. I love that Burhalter keeps talking about how this is prep for World Cup qualifiers. At some point, I would like Burhalter to talk about the importance of winning this tournament because it feels like we have a ready-made excuse if we don't win to say, you know, we were using this as preparation for World Cup qualifiers, which is our priority, which is why we didn't win. And to me, that's an excuse. Uh, it's not a valid reason. Okay. All right. Dominic Pittman. Can Wea and Aronson roam as well as Pulisic on the wings? Okay. Very good question, Dominic. Th all three of those guys are very different players, right? Uh, Christian Pulisic is explosive and very good 1v1, right? That is his big strength. When he is on form and running with the ball at his feet, very hard to stop him. Nobody in the pool is like Christian Pulisic in that sense. Brendan Aronson is a little bit better in tight places. Okay. In, in small, tight spaces, he's very technical. He can beat his man 1v1, but he doesn't have the same explosiveness as Pulisic. He's more of a guy who, to be honest, I think, I think that Brendan Aronson is somebody who against Honduras would be really good to have. 
because he's very good between the lines. He's one of those guys that can help to break down a bunkering low block. And I think that's what we're going to face against Honduras. I would not be opposed to starting him um, against Honduras. Not, not instead of Christian Pulisic, but maybe on the right wing. And then put Gio in the middle, Greg. Watch this video and change your mind. Anyways, he won't. But um, yeah. So, and then you have Tim Weah. Now, Tim Weah is a very vertical guy. He's not going to get too heavily involved in the build-up play, but he's very good at arriving in the box at the right time to finish. So he's not a guy who's going to be super involved in the build-up, uh, but he will give you clinical finishing. And he'll give you that verticality from the right wing um, that you want. So they're all three of these guys, different players, different strengths, um, and against different opponents, you want to be able to use them differently, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Pete, use a British accent. No, <laughs> no, Joshua, I am not your puppet for your entertainment. Uh, way at striker. I think he would do that well there. TBH. Thank you, Dominic, by the way, Kappa Mikey. Um, he's a good poacher. Think Chicharito, you know what I mean? He's a he's a finisher. He, he, he's good at moving off the ball, and he's good in the last 10 yards. But the way that Burhalter wants to play is he wants his forward to be a hold-up a hold up guy, like Sargent or Sibachu or even DK. And Weah isn't that guy, so I don't think he would work as a forward in Burhalter's system, although I'm sure in an emergency he could play there, Okay. What would be your starting 11 versus Honduras? Very good question, Jorge Castillo. Um, you know, it depends very much on if Adams is available. Okay, if Adams is available, then Stefan in goal, back four of Dest, Robinson, Brooks, and probably Miazga. <sighs> Although I would give McKenzie 90 minutes against Switzerland and just see how he does. I would give McKenzie maybe not 90 minutes, but I would give him a lot of time against Switzerland, maybe with Brooks and just see if he's an option there. Um, and then in midfield, I would have Adams, McKenney, and Reyna. I would have Pulisic on the left. I would probably have Aronson on the right and then Sargent up top. Um, that would be my starting 11. If Adams is not available, then Musa would replace Adams for me. Um, that would be my, so not much difference there. Okay. Dest will start at left back versus Honduras from Ken. Yeah, very possible. It's very possible. We don't really know what Greg's planning to do. I wouldn't hate that uh, simply because I think that Dest is a guy who he's not really a fullback. He, he, if you look at the way he plays, he's sort of an underlapping fullback. Okay. He's one of those fullbacks who's going to come inside and combine. He's not like Brian Reynolds, who wants to sprint down the field, use his pace, use his athleticism, and then put across him, right? Or or Anthony Robinson, who's very similar in that sense. Dest, when he gets into the final third, what does he do? He comes inside. And so that suits very well to being at left back. The other advantage of having Dest on the left is that you could maybe have a guy like Reggie Cannon on the right, who might be a little, well, We've seen Reggie Cannon as being more solid defensively than, you know, Serginho Dest, but he did not cover himself in glory in his Panama appearance. Now, that was one friendly game, but I was not impressed with Cannon at all. And frankly, Cannon has been a little up and down in Portugal this year. So I'm not sure what the right answer is. I would be fine with either at this point. Um, I would like to see DeAndre Edlin against Switzerland. Just see, has he improved, Right. Because we haven't all, you know, we don't, there's, it's hard to watch Turkish games. I haven't seen a lot of DeAndre yet in the last year or two. I'm not going to lie. But before that, for five years, that's what he was. He was, like I said, speed merchant with no technique. Now, has he improved enough that he could be a defensive option, even if he doesn't have elite technique? Is he still a liability? If we're trying to build out of the back and he gets pressed, is DeAndre Edlin going to be a liability? Okay. So questions there. Maybe we can answer a few of them against Switzerland. Okay. Should we overreact if we win, lose, or tie against Switzerland? No. Pete is too sleepy for early live streams. No, it's a friendly. You don't overreact to friendlies. Okay. <clears throat> Devonta Jones Jones. Thoughts on Acosta in the roster? I mean, I feel like I've given my thoughts. I don't think he should be here. Okay. Now people say, oh, but we have no other options. Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. We have Luca de la Torre. 
who would be a better option. In my opinion, Paxton Pomacall and Eric Williamson would both be better options. Um, and truth be told, because Gio Reyna, Christian Pulisic, and Brendan Aronson can all play central, I'd be fine with one less central midfielder and maybe bring in Daryl DK. Like, I'd rather have Daryl DK in the roster at this point than Kellen Acosta. I think that Daryl DK would offer us something very different if we badly need a goal and there's 20 minutes left against Mexico. You know, maybe you go two up top with Sargent and DK. And I just think that, you know, DK would come on and bully defenders. And I think that's a nice option to have. I wouldn't start him, but I think it's a nice option to have off the bench. Okay. Um, yeah. Hope, but hopefully the silver lining guys, I mean, I'm going to do a whole video when this international break is over about the gold cup roster. The gold cup roster is going to look at, it's going to look a lot better than we thought. Okay. And here's the other thing. Mexico is going to be stretched this summer, guys. If you look at Mexico, they don't have that much quality and depth. Like they're starting 11 is good, but they're, they don't have a lot of depth. So when they have to stretch that depth out over tournaments, I don't think they're going to have a very strong Gold Cup roster because they're going to the Olympics. So all of their guys from Liga MX, the young guys, your Roberto Alvarado, Charlie Rodriguez, your JJ Macias, your Uriel Antuna, all those guys, even Cesar Montes, they're all going to be at the Olympics. So I don't think their Gold Cup roster is going to be very strong because a lot of the big guys who are playing in this Nations League, I don't think they're going to be going to Gold Cup as well as Nations League. So I think we have a good chance to win Gold Cup even with our B team, although Jamaica and Canada could give us a real run for our money with our B team. Okay. Um, do you expect Switzerland's best as they prepare for the Euros? Dominic, I don't know what their plan is. Probably, I expect them to be preparing for the Euros, so probably a, a pretty good, strong lineup and a very good test for us. So, yeah. Uh, El Duke, are you concerned with our ability to implement a high press with players like Pulisic or Sargent who don't chase very well? Okay, Josh Sargent, I disagree with you. Josh Sargent is excellent in the press. In fact, he has been leading the pressing line for Werder Bremen all season. Pulisic, I agree with you. Pulisic, I don't think is the best presser in the world, right? That's just not the strongest part of his game. However, if you have guys like Sargent and McKenney and Reyna, and Musa, and Adams in the team. You don't need Pulisic to be as good pressing as you, you know what I mean? And also, there's a difference between pressing and counter-pressing, right? Pressing is when the opponent has the ball, and you press them, right? Whereas counter-pressing is when you lose the ball instantly, how do you get it back, right? How can you coordinate your team to be a counter-pressing team? And guys, this has implications for how you set up when you have the ball. Sometimes when you have the ball, you're also setting up that if you lose it, are you able to win it back right away? And that is a very important thing to be tactically. So just something to think about and something for Greg to be thinking about. But no, I'm not really that concerned about it because I think that Pulisic can press enough with his teammates that we could counter-press easily against Honduras when we lose the ball. Gio Reyna ceiling. Oh, ceiling is such a hard question to answer because, you know, his absolute ceiling, if everything goes well with his development and he gets his mentality right and he gets some experience. I mean, I think he's a Kevin De Bruyne type player. You know, I think that at 20, in his late 20s, he could be a Ballon d'Or candidate every year. But does that mean he's going to reach his ceiling? I don't know. A lot of it comes down to here, right? In fact, the biggest predictor of player success is talent, right? The second largest predictor of player success is mentality. And I tried to bring this up a little bit with David Ochoa because, um, yes, he's young and ex he's extremely talented. But if David Ochoa is going to reach his ceiling, he's going to have to change his focus from being a bad boy to being a good soccer player. And by that, I mean, especially as a goalkeeper where concentration is so crucial, I just see him not doing the basics very well sometimes. I've watched every single RSL game this season. And what I've noticed about Ochoa is two things. He does this dummy where he tries to pass the ball one way and then dummies and goes the other way with it. 
And sometimes it's necessary to fake out the opponent. And sometimes it's not. It just feels like he's doing it to be edgy. And I just, when you watch his, his inability to scoop a pass, like when a shot is played on the ground directly to him, those of you who've been goalkeepers in the past know this, right? You drop one knee to protect the space behind your, your, your hands and you scoop it up into your chest. And he never does that. It almost always bounces off of him. And then he has to go and collect the second ball. And to me, that's poor concentration, right? And I just think that with David Ochoa, as much as I love him, sometimes he is, he is going to have to change up here from I'm going to be an edgy bad boy to I'm going to be the best goalkeeper in the world. Because if he does, his ceiling is elite, elite. You know, he could be a top 10, 15 keeper in the world. If he doesn't change that mentality, he'll just be an average error-prone keeper. Talented but error-prone, which doesn't get you anywhere in the world of goalkeeping, right? Okay. But yeah, Gio Reyna's ceiling, like I said, Josie, 33, great name. Um, Kevin De Bruyne. Boiled milk, <laughs> what? <laughs> These guys, your guys' names are awesome. Boiled milk steak to go. What do you think about Jonathan Gomez, good one, being called up to Mexico today, potential starting left back for us? Um, obviously, you know, being called up to train with the senior team is something that does worry me a little bit. However, I can tell you guys that I have a contact who knows Jonathan Gomez very well, or quite well, I would say, who is who I spoke with this morning. And I don't want to say his name because he, you know, this was a private conversation. He hasn't given me permission to say his name, but he told me that he prefers the US. Um, but that being said, if a senior national team calls you up, you don't say no, especially if it's just a training. It's not a cap tying thing. Uh, why not go? First of all, you get an opportunity to you know, go train with them. And second of all, you put pressure on your own federation, right? Now Burhalter has to go, ooh, they want Jonathan Gomez. Maybe we call him in for a Gold Cup roster, you know? Um, I'm not extremely worried so long as Greg Burhalter and Brian McBride do their job. I think that Jonathan Gomez will represent us based on what I've heard from my contact that he does prefer the U.S., but he's keeping his options open. I mean, look, guys, Justin Che said he wanted to play for Germany, right? It's it's not always that that's what they want, but they're using it as leverage to get on the national team. Uh, we saw this. Lots of guys do this. We saw Ulianes do this. We saw Alex Mendez do this. We saw Richie Ledesma do this. We saw Sebastian Soto do this. It's a tactic that, you know, a dual national can use to get our attention, right? So, yeah. Well, you know, I'm not that worried about Jonathan Gomez unless the Federation goofs up, which their record with dual nationals is excellent. There's no, we have no reason to believe that Greg Berhalter is not going to put the full court press on Jonathan Gomez and have him come represent us. Okay. Jorge Villatoro, three in the back for Nations League. Oh, good question. I love this. Top five USA strikers. Okay. Great question, Jorge. I love tactical questions. So I would love to see a three in the back uh, if it is a 3-4-3 three, three, or a 3-5-2, okay? Because then you could have Brooks in the middle, McKenzie on the left, and Miazga on the right, which I personally would like to see. Um, and then Serginho Dest and Anthony Robinson as, um, <clears throat> as wingbacks. Still have three in the middle, and then you could have two up top. So the two up top would be the forward plus Pulisic. So Pulisic would now play as a second forward with the freedom to roam. That I would love to see that in a 3-5-2. Or in a 3-4-3, you have two central midfielders. Um, so let's say Adams is injured and you want to go McKenney and Musa as those central midfielders. You know, and then you still have your, you know, your wing backs basically become wingers almost, but they still have defensive jobs, but more than a winger, less than a fullback. Um, and then you can still have your top three up, up front of Reyna, Pulisic, and Sargent. So in against Northern Ireland, we played this sort of bizarre four three two one, which I didn't love and I really didn't think worked, you know. So yeah, um, I would love to see a back three, but I think if we're going to do it, we should try it against Switzerland again in a different format so that we we're more used to it against Honduras. Okay, yeah, this is a good one from Nabuto. How you doing, sir? Uh, didn't Azcona reject Dominican Republic recently for the U.S.? Or is that just a rumor? No, um, as, as far as I've heard, yes, that is true. That he did reject it because he wants to play for the U.S. 
And this kid is really talented kid. We saw him in the Olympic qualifiers. He was better than all of our under 23 guys, and he's only 17. So if he wants to play for us, then we should absolutely, you know, I mean, it sucks because we don't have any youth camps right now. You know, uh, we need to have maybe call him into a pre gold cup roster, you know, just to kind of see how he does and to remind him that we like him and, and that, you know, we want him with our program because he's an elite player. If you look at his profile, you know, probably the best player in the Dominican Republic squad ever. Like I said on Twitter, part of me during the Olympics, I was like, I don't want to go call up the only good guy that they have, you know, but he could be really good. Hang on guys. Going to take this call. Hello. One of those spam calls asking for my social security number. <clears throat> okay. Um, what do we got? Great questions, guys. Um, hang on. I, I didn't answer the second part of your question before when you asked about the top five strikers, right? That was the second part of the question. I'm sorry. I missed that. Top five. So my depth chart for the forwards right now is as follows. Sergeant, DK, Sibachu, Hoppy, and then Zardes. So Zardes is currently fifth for me, for now, until somebody comes and overtakes him. But those would be my current five. Maybe Joaquini, actually, no. Fifth would be Joaquini and then Zardes. Zardes would be sixth. So he wouldn't be in my top five. I'm glad to see no Zardes in this roster. Can we just acknowledge how great it is that there's no Ariola, no um, no Ariola, no Zardes, no Roldan, no Lovitz, no Gonzalez. Now we just got those last two, <laughs> Yule and Acosta. Dominican stud. Don't worry. I'll call Ascona. All Dominican Americans know each other. Do it, man. Do it. Tell them to come represent us. All right. Here's a very good one. Christian Velasquez. At Yank, you have to bring in one ex-USMNT player at their prime to this current team. Who would you bring in? Mine would be Tim Howard since we don't have any good goalkeepers at this moment. Ooh, that's tough. I mean, I, my instinct would be Clint Dempsey, but I think you're right. We have a lot of attacking options, and we're still a little bit weak defensively. I mean, as yeah, I would, I would I agree with you. I'd, I'd call in Tim Howard as well in his prime. He was amazing as prime. So, but I do like Dempsey a lot. Okay. Dempsey, Lalas, <laughs> Lalas. Oh my God. Laurel, Laurel Iyer. Any thoughts on Kevin Paredes? He looked really good as a left back for DC United the other night. I, um, I haven't watched a lot of DC United Laurel. I want to, there's just so many games to watch. Um, I do want to see him. I also want to see, uh, what's his name? Moises Nyman as well. Um, so I will be watching more of DC in the future, and I'll be able to give you a better answer when I actually know what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. What is up with Haji Wright? Haji Wright is currently in Denmark, I believe. Um, I don't really rate Haji Wright, guys. He's a very slow, immobile, technically poor player that I just – I really don't rate him, guys. I mean, I know some people want him to be involved. I, I personally, everything I've seen from him is, is a no for me. All right. Okay, Pete, who do you think is a better manager, Mexico or USA? That's not even close. It's Tata Martino. Um, he's just done more. I mean, Barcelona, Argentina, Paraguay. Atlanta United, Mexico. That's his resume. Greg Berhalter's resume is the Swedish second division, Columbus crew, USMNT. So <laughs> there's a pretty big difference. Somebody who, who was it? Um, somebody talked about if we get to the final and lose to Mexico, should we fire Berhalter? No, I don't think so. Unless we get blown out. Okay, if we look poor against Honduras and then get blown out by Mexico, oh man, it's so tough because we're at this crucial juncture right now where we're so close to World Cup qualifying. 
it's very dangerous to start changing coaches around now. A B the question has to be when you're firing a coach is, do we have somebody better that can replace him? Now we don't have Jesse Marsh. He's not an option. Now he just got the job at Leipzig. I don't think he would come to coach the U S right now. If we had asked him six months ago, I think he would have, I'm not sure he would go right now. So then that leaves guys like maybe Oscar Pereja, Caleb Porter, maybe Greg Vanny. I just don't see a lot of good options. You know, maybe it's some, there's some foreign coach who could, but it's risky, right? I don't know, man. This is a complicated one. I I'm not a fan of, of firing Greg Berhalter yet, even though I think that he still has a lot to learn. And I think there's a lot of question marks about some of his tactics, but I don't know. It's not just what, if we win, it's how we play that there's a lot to consider. You know, I can't give you a solid answer on that one. Okay. Boom. We should bring in Pellegrino Matarazzo or whatever his name is. Yeah. I don't know if he would come right away. He spent his entire life coaching in Europe and he's building some real, <coughs> excuse me, some real momentum. I don't know if Matarazzo would come right away, honestly. All right, guys, a few more. No, not Pirlo. Get out of here. Not Guys, you can't just hire these green coaches who've, who've never coached or barely coached in their lives, like one season at Juventus. You no, know, good players do not good coaches make necessarily, okay? I think one of Juventus' big mistakes was hiring, hiring Pirlo. I don't think he's that good. He's just inexperienced. He's very young. He needs to start somewhere else, maybe in the youth level, maybe in the lower divisions, maybe as an assistant coach. Earn his chops, learn the game, learn what coaching is. You don't just throw... You know, look at Frank Lampard. I mean, look at Mikel Arteta. These guys are so young and they're just getting coaching jobs because they were good players when it is a completely different job. Being a good player doesn't mean you're going to be a good coach. It can help, but there are plenty of good players who are terrible coaches. You know, look at Thierry Henry. Okay. Uh, what do we got? Somebody had a good one. Okay, Pete, no Corona or Jimenez. What other player can Lozano give the USMNT trouble if Mexico is fit to face USMNT? Hang on. I know there's no Jimenez, but is Tecatito also ruled in there? Who's in their Nations League roster? Is Tecatito in it? Does anybody know? Hang on. M let me just look this up. Mexico Nations League roster. Because I know that Tecatito was a doubt because of his injury. But I don't know. Oh, here we go. Mexico squad. Is this it? Does anybody know if their Nations League roster is out, guys? Because I do not. Put it in the put it in the chat. Oh, it says Jimenez and Tecatito are in it. Wait, Jimenez is in the Nations League? I'm not talking about the Albi Anderson. I'm not talking about the provisional roster. I'm talking about the final 23. It was supposed to be submitted today. Um, if anybody knows, has a link to it or knows where I can find it, maybe Twitter. Mexico Nations League roster. See if that pops anything up. Because I've seen the preliminary roster. I have not seen their final 23. And I'm not sure why. So if somebody can give me if anyone, if, okay, so what we know right now is Jimenez probably out. I would be very surprised if he's in this Nations League 23. As far as Ticketito, he's probably like Tyler Adams, where they're hoping he's going to be fit. But that is two of their three best players, guys. And that is yet another reason why I think we need to win this tournament, okay? Because in Mexico, without Raul Jimenez, who for me is their best player, was their best player before he was injured, that front three of Tecatito, Raul Jimenez, and Chucky Lozano was fierce. But if two of those guys aren't there, who's their center forward, right? We saw last month when they played Wales and Costa Rica, they had Lozano playing as their center forward, okay? They didn't bring Chicharito. They didn't bring J.J. Macias. They, they have guys like Henry Martin, Alan Pulido, who plays in Sporting Kansas, I just, you know, look at that drop-off. Rodolfo Pizarro is another guy. Maybe Diego Lainez. 
I mean, that's not a huge, that's not a huge threat to be honest. So I think we should beat Mexico. Just my opinion though. Can someone call Marsh to save Sergeant from the dumpster fire that's called Werder Bremen? Um, I would like to see that. I'd like to see him over at, at Leipzig. I think he could do a great job. Okay. Last question, guys, because I'm losing my voice here. Last one from Michael Garrison. What teams qualify for the final round of World Cup qualifying? My money is on Canada, Curacao, and St. Kitts. I don't know about St. Kitts, but Canada and Curacao for sure. Okay. <coughs> Quickly on Josh Sargent. I think he's going to move, and I think he needs to move, guys. Last question here. How would you feel about Arsene Wenger taking over? He's been very positive about our young talent and would be an elite coach. No, no. Um, look, the guy's in his mid-70s. We, we need a coach who understands the American landscape, who is – I, I don't want to imply that Arsene Wenger is not – no, just no. He's not – no. He's not the kind of guy that I can see coaching the U.S., you know, um, he, he wasn't successful for a very long time in the last 10 years at Arsenal. And I just don't think he's the kind of guy that we have a very young, hungry, youthful, energetic squad of players. And I just think that a 75 year old retired Frenchman, regardless of how much success he may have had in the late nineties and early two thousands is not the way to go for the U S even if he is pretty okay. Tactically, I just think we need somebody that fits the type of player pool that we are, you know what I mean? And the type of players that we have. So I would not be a fan of bringing in Arsene Wenger. Okay. <laughs> what if U S blows out Mexico seven, one or something like that, that's not going to happen. Will the Federation and Liga MX finally wake up and do right by their players? As in, when you say do right by their players, do you mean, Send, sell them to Europe and have them go abroad? Maybe. But it's not just... Okay, people blame Liga Mekis a lot of the time for having, you know, having these guys not leave Liga Mekis. But the truth is, it's not just the clubs. The players themselves are very comfortable in Mexico. They get paid very well. You know, I wish I had... Let me read this to you. Um, somebody sent this to me on Twitter, and it was actually a quote from El Loco, Bielsa, okay? And he said, so he used to coach in Mexico in the second division, and before he left, he had this to say, and, and this is coming from Marcelo Bielsa, one of the greatest coaches. The majority of Mexican footballers that play in Liga MX believe themselves to be world-class stars. With their first big paychecks, they go directly to buy themselves brand new cars to pick up TV novella actresses and fake friends that supply them alcohol. Football comes second. Okay, so when we talk about them not going to Europe, yes, there's an aspect of it where their clubs overprice them, so it becomes very hard for them to move. But there's an aspect, too, of if you're a young Mexican player, a lot of them are getting paid half a million dollars a year to play for Chivas Guadalajara or more sometimes if you're, you know, one of the, the better ones you know, uh, one or two million. So now why should you go to Europe? Why should you go to Holland for $250,000, right? Because again, the goal is to make money, not to improve yourself, right? And that's what a local Bielsa was trying to say. So who knows? But I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to blow them out 7-1. Guys, losing my voice. This is awesome. Thanks for everything. Uh, everybody who co contributed to the chat, you guys are awesome. I cannot wait. So Filippo and I will be here for the champions league final on f Saturday, I believe. Uh, and then Switzerland game on the 30th. I'm going to see you guys all there. Don't forget to like the stream, leave your comments, guys. This has been awesome. We have a very, very exciting international final semifinal and final coming up. I cannot wait. It's going to be awesome. You guys have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you soon.